I'm Carolyn Puckett. As well as a master gardener, I am a master naturalist. I am also a Maryland woodland steward. I'm on the Maryland Invasive Species Council and I, run, I sort of oversee the county's weed warriors that I'll talk about in a minute. I'm gonna be wearing my naturalist hat more than the gardening hat for this presentation, okay? This is audience participation. What kind of landscape is this? Pardon? Desert, okay. What kind of landscape is this? Hmm? Suburban desert. He's exactly right. Have any of you seen any landscapes that look like this in Carroll County? You'll see it has lots of turf grass, a little row of maybe, I don't know, maybe Japanese hollies that looks like maybe an azalea over there, one little tree over here. This lawn probably goes on and on and on. A lot of places in Carroll County have three acres in their property and it is three acres of grass and from the standpoint of wildlife, our native critters, that is a desert. What about this one? Okay. Huh? Hmm? This is English ivy. It would provide a shelter for some little mice and stuff, but, but nobody eats it. It's not, it's not supporting any wildlife. Again, we have a little hedge of, of maybe boxwood or something, some kind of little, I think it's a Pyrrhus andromeda, not, not native, uh, and lots of pavement. This, again, from the viewpoint of wildlife is a desert. Why do we love our lawns so much? Why do we all have acres and acres of lawns in our neighborhoods? Advertising. What? Advertising. Advertising, yes. HOAs. HOAs, <laughs> yes. Your homeowner association probably likes grass. Lawn Pardon? Sheep. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to drag you. Yes, you could raise sheep on it. Pardon? That's what home builders put in. Scared to do something else. Yeah, we're scared to do anything else. This is their default. If we don't know what to do, we put in turf grass. Turf grass, by the way, is not native. You heard Kurt Dreyer this morning talk about what. The early colonists saw, you didn't talk, hear him talk about any acres and acres of turf grass. These are things that we brought over from Europe. Some people speculate that we like grass because our ancestors uh, evolved in the African savanna and we want lawns so we can see the tigers and the lions approaching us to get us. So if you have a lot of lions and tigers in your neighborhood, you might want the lawn. There are purposes for lawns. If you have children that need a play area, there's nothing better than lawns. You might have dogs that need to run on it. But apart from a very limited number of uses, lawn doesn't really serve much of a purpose. Usually when I ask why lawn, somebody will say, well, it's for erosion control. Well, yeah, it's better than dirt, but it's not nearly as good as trees and shrubs and things. Okay, when the colonists got here, 950 million acres of virgin forest, the entire eastern United States was forest interspersed with meadow lands that the Native Americans did burns and, and managed. So it was managed even then, but it was, it was still, he talked about how huge the trees were. I mean, they were huge trees here. If you see an old forest now and think that's a really old forest, it is second growth forest. There's not much of, of any old growth forest in the United States. Prairies once covered 40%. Once you get further out west, there's short grass prairies and there's tall grass prairies. This is less than 4%. I was being conservative. I have seen estimates that we have less than 1% of our prairie because the same soil that grows prairie grasses grows corn. corn, yes. We have these little parks and preserves, right? 
So that shouldn't be a problem. Wildlife can live in these little parks and preserves. Well, the trouble with them is they're little bitty islands. And little bitty islands can only support little bitty populations. And little bitty populations go extinct. What we have now, lots and lots of houses, over four million miles of roads. In Carroll County, we have a lot of agriculture mixed in with suburbs. There's only about 5% of the entire United States that's considered pristine, and it's usually out in the desert <laughs> where we just didn't want to be, or it's too high. But it's also too dry and too high to support much in the way of wildlife. You heard Kirk talk about when they got here, we had the woods, this is Maryland specific, and the Piedmont. We live in the Piedmont area of Maryland. We had the clear streams, we had woodlands, we did have these prairie-like grasslands. Carroll County did have a lot of these grasslands in the northern part of the county. Now, by the time Kirk was talking about in the 18th century, a lot of the species had already been driven out of this part of Maryland. But those buffalo, there was a, there was a species called wood bison, and it's, ex, it's extinct, it doesn't exist anymore, but it lived here in Maryland and, and, and Carroll County, and Carroll County had elk. Today, Carroll County has the least amount of woods in Maryland. We have virtually no old growth forest. There's, there's a, a little piece of old growth over uh, on the eastern shore. There's a few little areas over in the mountains, but pretty much in the 19th century, we clear cut America. I mean, we just cut everything down. There is very, very little old growth forest left. Result. Anywhere mankind has set his foot, extinctions of other species follow. That's just the way it is. You heard Kirk say there was a difference between Western Maryland, where the colonists hadn't got yet, and Eastern part of Maryland and Middle Maryland, where the, where the colonists, that far back, we were already losing species. Extirpated means these 135 species that used to live in Maryland there's not a single one of them in Maryland anymore. They're gone. 600 more species are threatened or endangered in Maryland. We're talking Maryland alone here. 198 bird species are threatened or endangered. And the number one reason is loss of habitat because we have paved over, we have built buildings, we have put in lawns, and we have taken the habitat away from these animals. You may be familiar, I suspect, with the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. That was, there was a big asteroid six miles in diameter, in diameter that, that came in and hit at the Yucatan Peninsula in the Americas. And it threw up all of this dust and sulfur and stuff and you had basically a winter that basically killed, well, it killed all the big dinosaurs, but it killed probably three quarters of all life on the earth. That was actually, I don't know, that was actually the fifth major extinction on earth. There were four other extinctions before that, and, and we're not quite sure what caused that. But a lot of scientists say that we are now in the middle of the sixth extinction because of the rapidity of the loss of species. In a normal situation, you might lose one species in 700 years. We are losing species so fast that a lot of scientists are saying we are now in the middle of the sixth extinction period. Well, who's going to provide this habitat? We tend to think, well, they'll go live someplace else. You know, they can go live in the parks. They can, you know, there must be somewhere. Or we think, does it matter? I mean, do we care? Do we care if all these species are missing? I mean, some of them, you know, uh, the, the major predators are the ones that go first. Wolves, cougars used to be in Maryland, no more. You know, we don't have a lot of black bear here, a few, a few over in Western Maryland. Uh, 
so we, you know, we think, well, who cares? Well, if we do care, the only people that are going to be able to provide this habitat are those sitting out here in this audience or me. 82% of Maryland forest is privately owned. We are going to have to do something with our three acres of grass to provide habitat if these animals are not going to go extinct. Why do we need biodiversity? Without plants, there is no life on Earth. If we all disappeared tomorrow, Earth would go on just fine. If plants disappear tomorrow, that's it. That's the end. It is plants that capture the energy from the sun and convert it into food. Convert it into food for us, for insects, for other animals. But it, it's plants that do that. Even if you're thinking about, well, we have oil for energy or we have coal, where do they come from? Plants. Plants back in the Jurassic period or the Cretaceous period or, or whenever before, before the uh, asteroid hit. Plants are the basis of life on Earth. Where do you think we get our oxygen? Plants. Plants use carbon dioxide. You hear about climate change because there's so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Plants take up carbon dioxide. They use that with the sunlight to produce food and oxygen as a byproduct. Without plants, there's no oxygen for us to breathe. These plants feed insects. We were talking about uh, IPM for insects. I would like you to learn to love insects. Insects are at the bottom of the food chain. A lot, a lot of our native critters subsist on insects. Even something as big as a black bear, about a quarter of its diet is insects. You've got to have insects. If you provide the habitat I'm going to be talking to you about, you're not only doing a favor for wildlife, you're doing a favor for yourself. I think lawns are boring. They're not interesting. They're not pretty. They're just, ugh. They're just lawns. Wildlife habitat can be beautiful. It doesn't, people think, well, habitat, that's weedy. No, it doesn't have to look weedy. We are not really going to create a natural environment. We are never going to be, go, be able to go back to nature. Even before the colonists got here, the Native Americans were manipulating it. Okay? We can't achieve pure nature, but we can still provide habitat, and it does not have to look weedy. Trees increase your property value. Energy savings, Connie talked about, you plant trees to the south and to the west of, of your house, it will, trees will cool your property by about 10 degrees, sometimes even more than that. I have seen ranges like 10 to 45 degrees from the EPA. So they will cool your house. You don't have to mow if you have a, what we're going to talk about at Habitat. I have one acre. Uh, I have over the years pretty much gotten rid of uh, almost all. I have a little bit of grass right in front of my house, a little bit of grass right behind it, and I have some paths through what are basically huge garden beds. And that's all the grass I have on my acre. Even with my little push mower, I can mow the whole thing in 20 minutes. You know, it, it's, this is very time consuming. And when you're not mowing, you're not spewing all of those toxins into the atmosphere. Mowing for one hour creates as much pollution as driving 650 miles. So you're polluting. And then there are all those people manufacturing lawnmowers and uh, weed whackers and everything else. You do not have to buy mulch for this. I do not buy mulch except I have a little place right in front of my house and behind, you know, where I like to look neat. And I do mulch that. The rest of the, my yard, it uses the leaves to mulch. So I don't have to buy mulch. I do not buy fertilizers. I do not buy pesticides. The only pesticide I have used, I do have woolly adelgas that have attacked by hemlocks, and I sprayed some horticultural oil on it, which is a very benign organic way to approach them. 
That's it. I have not had, and I do not have a pest problem. I do not. I've had, even when everybody was having all the stink bugs, I saw two that year. I probably have not seen 10 stink bugs on my property in the entire time since we've had stink bugs. I do not have a pest problem. It, Mother Nature, once it's in balance, takes care of itself. It's interesting that the same type of landscape that's good for wildlife also happens to be good for our streams and our rivers and our Chesapeake Bay. You're going to have a speaker this afternoon that talks about that more, so I'm not going to go into that a lot. It improves the air quality, it sequesters carbon, and it not only is in balance, it actually will reduce pest numbers. Uh, Mike Ropp that you saw earlier in, in the video and Paula Shrewsbury that also works at University of Maryland have done studies. And they have found that if you have a wide diversity of plants, which is what we need for wildlife, you actually have a lot fewer pests. So you have more plants, fewer pests. It's been scientifically established. There are lots of different kind of habitats. If you don't like trees, you can still have a habitat without trees. There are different kinds of wildlife that live in different kinds of habitat. Old growth forest, there are some types of animals that is the only place they can live. The ivory billed woodpecker, which, which is probably extinct, but maybe not, over out of the uh, uh, Ozarks, it can only live in, in, in old growth forest. If it has no old growth forest, it's going to die out. Early successional forest, if you, if you go in and you cut all your trees down, when the, the forbs first you get two or three years where you get grasses come up and maybe some goldenrod and some asters and stuff and then you start getting shrubs and trees, that's early successional. That, interestingly enough, is one of the types of habitat that we're really missing in Maryland anymore. And there are species that want to live in that type of habitat and they're having problems. Temporary forest openings, if you have a tornado that comes through or wildfire, something like that. Forest edges, we're going to talk about an edge. Is anybody, what's a forest edge, anybody? Edge of the woods, okay. It's basically where you have one type of habitat, usually we think of it as woods, and then it stops, and then you have another type of habitat. If it is grass, that's considered a hard edge. If you, if you then have trees, but then you have shrubs and perennials and stuff, that's considered a soft edge. Soft edges support more wildlife. Most of our backyard critters like edge habitat. Grasslands and meadows, uh, there are species that can only survive. Again, this is a, another type of landscape that we don't have very much of in Maryland anymore. We have pastures for uh, domestic animals, but we don't really have grasslands and meadows to support wildlife. Streams and rivers, wetlands, and barrens. Uh, the barrens, the largest barren in the United States is not very far from here. What is it? The Soldier's Delight, which is just over the, the uh, county line in Baltimore County. Barrens have, have very, very thin soil on top of rocks and they the one particularly uh, at Soldier Slide has a lot of toxic type chemicals in it naturally. So the, you have pine birds and there are kinds of species that can only live in barrens. Okay so let's get to specifics. What do we need to have in our landscape if we're supposed to support wildlife? Wildlife need four things. Food, water, shelter, you think of those, but there's a fourth one, space. The amount of space you have determines the kind of wildlife you can support. And they need to be together within a reasonable distance. If you have water way over that way and the food way over that way, well, the birds can fly across to it, but a lot of, a lot of uh, animals can't. So it must be available within a, a fairly contained area. The one you have least of determines the number of animals in a species that your property can support. So if you had lots of 
food and shelter, but you had no water, that water would be the limiting factor because it's the one that you have least of. Steve mentioned biodiversity. I am going to hit you with this over and over and over. Biodiversity is the key to supporting wildlife. The more kinds of plants you have, the more types of critters that you can support. These little critters, they need food year round. So the more kinds of plants you have, some in the spring, food, some in the summer, some in the fall, some in the winter, you need food year round for your wildlife. It can be flary, flowers, we usually think of, of course, in the, in the spring and summer, but berries, the berries that are on our plants provide food during the winter, fruits and nuts, nuts, the acorns, hickories, they provide food during the winter. And I'm going to hit this one again, a larval host. We're going to be talking about butterfly gardening in a while. What is the life cycle of a butterfly? Anybody remember? Hmm? Have an egg. The caterpillar, the larva. Then the pupa, and then the adult. If you're, most people, if they're putting in a butterfly garden, what do they want to plant? What's the number one plant people think of? Butterfly bush, it provides nectar to the adult butterfly. It does not provide food to any caterpillar, none. If you're going to have butterflies, you've got to have caterpillars. So we need to have host larva plants. Not all plants are equal. Our native critters, our insects, our butterflies, our bees, all of our native, native critters evolved with our native plants. Often the insects cannot digest anything except maybe one family of plants or two or three. So somebody earlier mentioned, well, I guess it was Connie, said, well, if you have a certain amount of space, you can put a non-native tree there. Or you can put a native tree there. If you put a native tree there, you're probably going to support wildlife. The master gardeners, as you know, we, we uh, hundreds of us trek down to College Park every summer for one day of training. I remember once going out over the campus with one of the University of Maryland people, and they're wandering around saying, this is a ginkgo tree. This is the perfect tree for your landscape. Nothing bothers it. That afternoon, Doug Ptolemy, that I'm going to talk about a little bit more, who is head of entomology at the University of Delaware, is doing his talk on bringing nature home about supporting wildlife. And he shows a picture of the ginkgo and he says, this is a terrible tree to plant in your landscape. It does not support anything. So it depends on what you're trying to do. <laughs> uh, natives are usually better. Now, we have a lot of non-native plants that are perfectly nice plants. As a matter of fact, a lot of our food that we eat are not native. Our lettuces and our eggplants and you know, all that stuff, those are not native. They're perfectly well behaved. But there are some non-native plants that we call invasive exotic species. And these plants are not well behaved. They take over. They are like the German army invading Poland. I mean, they are there and they just, you know, they, they take over. They take over for several reasons. One thing, they green up before our native plants and they shade out our native plants. They tend to produce lots and lots and lots of seed. One multiflora rose can produce one million seed in one year. Lots of seed, they tend to be sterlinifrous, they send out runners, and they don't generally have the native enemies here that keep them in check. Like Steve was talking about how the stink bug here was such a problem, but in China it was no big deal because they had an ecology that kept it in check. A lot of the invasive plants, you can still go to your local nursery and buy unfortunately. English ivy, we talked earlier that that's a desert. That's a desert. 
It doesn't support any wildlife other than providing a little shelter. When it climbs your trees, when it's evergreen, when the snow hits it, all that snow, well, it can bring down your tree from the weight of it. Poison, uh, English ivy blooms when it climbs up a tree, the shape of the leaf changes, and when it gets up high, then it does bloom and it makes berries and the wildlife eat it and spread it. Some states, particularly out in the Northwest, it's against the law to buy and plant English ivy. Years ago, I was down towards D.C. There's a little island called Roosevelt Island in the middle of the Potomac, if you've ever been there. When I was there, it was like three quarters English ivy. And I think since they've had people in there and try to get rid of that English ivy, but it, it'll just absolutely take over. Parsonberry vine, uh, when I was going through my Master Naturalist training, I did part of it at Robert E. Lee Park in Baltimore. There's one area, it's about half an acre of nothing but porcelain berry vine. It's very pretty, has nice leaves, sort of like grape leaves, and has these beautiful blue berries. Terribly invasive. Japanese barberry. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you have Japanese barberry in your landscapes? I think there are an awful lot of landscapers that basically know six plants, and they use those same six plants everywhere. Japanese barberry is particularly popular at service stations where they have a little island and three little plants in it. There's usually Japanese barberry because it's tough. It comes in pretty colors. You know, it comes in golds and purples and reds. It produces lots and lots of berries, and it spreads, and it fills the woods. It has been found that ticks, high populations or tick, of ticks are associated with high populations of Japanese barberry. <laughs> burning bush. Everybody seems to have burning bush. My, hus my late husband, bless his heart, when, when he lived in North Carolina before I knew him, he had burning bush. And so when we bought our property, he, he just had to have burning bush. We, we, we planted a couple of burning bushes. I didn't know at the time they were invasive. Well, I live in the woods. You know, it doesn't get any sun. It never did turn red. So I finally, after a few years, particularly after I found out it's invasive, persuaded him we ought to get rid of them, and we cut, I cut them down. It, that was probably 15 years ago. I am still put in, pulling up seedlings of burning bush. But we like it. Bush honeysuckle, you're probably more familiar with the Japanese honeysuckle, the vine. It's invasive, but this bush honeysuckle, is, it's a, well, it's a bush. It looks like honeysuckle, but it's a bush. And the state used to promote that. I was down at the Aubrey Carroll uh, Bird Sanctuary in Mount Airy, Mount Airy, and they had all of this bush honeysuckle all over the place. When I asked them about that, they said, well, that's what the state told us to plant, you know? Yeah, yeah, they gave it away. But, but the birders have sort of come around <laughs> to understanding that the berries are pretty, but they don't have the same lipid value. They don't have the same calories. They don't support wildlife as well. They're there at the wrong time to support migrating birds. There are birds that tend to stay here like cardinals and robins because they green out early tend to nest in them, but it's very low, and, and so the predators tend to get them. So that's not good, but you can go to a nursery and buy that. Bradford pears, boy, in the 50s, weren't Bradford pears popular? <laughs> they were supposed to be sterile. They were supposed to be sterile, but they had weak wood, and they were always breaking, so the horticulturists came up with improved <laughs> calorie pears. Bradford is a type of calorie pear and when they put those in the landscape it crossed with the Bradford pears and now Bradford pears are everywhere. In the spring when you're driving down the interstate and you see all of these pretty white trees blooming probably most of them are Bradford pear. And Norway maple. Norway maple is the number one selling shade tree in America and it is highly invasive. Instead Plant these things. In your book, you have a handout that's native plants for wildlife conservation. Okay? So I, you don't have to memorize this. You've also got a copy of my PowerPoints in your, in your book. But these are native trees that are 
high on the list of plants that support wildlife. Oaks, hickories, beech, walnuts have your nuts. Persimmons, service berries, black gums have, have berries on them. Pines, pine nuts. You know, the little critters like to eat pine nuts as well as we do. Crab apples. I have, there are some native crab apples and there are non-native crab apples. And they have, they have crossed and it's hard to know what you're getting. Fortunately, they're close enough genetically that the wildlife that can eat the caterpillars and stuff that can eat our native crab apples can also eat the non-native crab apples. I have one crab apple tree in my yard. Uh, it produces heavily about every other year. Usually long about February, I will get a huge flock of either robins or cedar wax wings. I mean, our, we're talking 100, 200 birds, and they spend a week stripping because that's one of the few, few foods that's available at that time of year. Dogwoods, hawthorn. This picture is a hawthorn. I think that's just as pretty as the burning bush. The birds, this is not their favorite food. So it tends to stick around. The berries stay there until late in the winter and when there's nothing else for them to eat in February, that's when they're going to come eat these berries. So you have your berries for a long time and they're beautiful. So this is your top layer, layer your canopy layer. Underneath your canopy layer, you have an understory or shrub. And there are lots of native plants that like that understory. When I bought my property, I did find that I had, I was very fortunate, I did not have a lot of multiflora rose and invasives. I had uh, lots of maple leaf viburnum and arrowwood viburnums, and I had dogwoods and things. Vines, people think Virginia creeper is a weed, and so they pull that out and they plant English ivy instead. My next door neighbor did that. She pulled out all of her, English, all of her Virginia creeper and planted English ivy and it is now pulling down the trees. Uh, Virginia creeper is, is pretty. It turns these red colors in the fall and it supports wildlife. It's, a, it's for a naturalized area in my woods behind my house. It's naturalized. It makes a nice ground cover. and I just let it go and it does just fine. It will climb trees, but it doesn't hurt them. Wild grapes, you'll wonder about poison ivy. You think, well, you probably don't want poison ivy in your garden beds. However, one I mentioned one organization I mentioned is the Carroll County Weed Warriors. There is a booth out here if you're interested. We do free training on invasive plants, on how to get rid of them, and then we ask people if they will to volunteer. We go out to Piney Run Nature Center or Bear Branch Nature Center and other places and try to get rid of those invasives. It's for uh, kids aged middle school and up. Okay, but we do not bother the poison ivy. Now they have trail maintenance and they will get it out of the trails, but as long as it's not in the trail, poison ivy is good. While it is poisonous to us, it's not poisonous to our native critters. It provides food for the birds and other animals. So if you have a naturalized area where you're not gonna be getting into the poison ivy, it's good to leave it. After that, you have your perennials. I did a garden tour of Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands in September of 2013. These were absolutely gorgeous gardens, probably we saw 40 different gardens. Guess what they were growing over there? Sunflowers, asters, goldenrods, coneflowers, beeple. All of these are native here and we do not grow them. And I go to Europe and it's like, like two thirds of them were all, all the gardens were growing these things. They're beautiful plants. This orange thing in front, that's butterfly weed. That's in the milkweed family. What, what's the critter that monarch. monarch butterfly? But it's pretty. That's the tall thing or that's liatris. Uh, Steve mentioned mints. There are native mints other than the spearmint and peppermint and stuff, but there are also native mints. Native mints are extremely good for air insects and pollinators. They're native grasses. It does not have to look weedy. That doesn't look weedy to me. I guarantee that those gardens I went to see in Europe did not look weedy. They were beautiful and they were our native perennials. Okay, so we've been talking about food. Water, if you're lucky enough to have a stream on your property, 
it would be wonderful of you to plant a buffer, 35 feet minimum, if you have enough property, 100 feet. That is excellent wildlife habitat. It's excellent for the quality of our streams and our water and what floats down into the bay. If you don't have a stream, if you just have a pond, if you have a pond, try to have one end that's very shallow. That's so the little critters can come up and get a drink without drop, falling in and drowning. If you have a bird bath, there are ways you can heat it for the winter. It needs to be fairly shallow. You don't want your water over three inches deep because the birds don't want to drown either. If your bird bath is deeper than that, you can put gravel and stuff in the bottom because it's, it's better to have sort of a rough bottom to it than a smooth one. What is a vernal, vernal pool? Pardon? Temporary it's temporary. It's temporary. This is a vernal pool. It usually appears in late winter when the snow melts and then, and then early spring. And it's ephemeral. It disappears when it gets hot and dry. This is the preferred breeding habitat for our amphibians, our frogs, and our salamanders. This is where they go to party hardy and lay their eggs. Why would they want to lay their eggs in a piece of water that may dry up before the eggs even hatch? Why? No fish. No fish. There's no fish to eat it. If you have a pond, if you're wanting to support wildlife, do not put goldfish in that pond. Do not put koi in that pond. They're going to eat it. They're going to eat the wildlife. Okay? Those are not native. Okay, if you want to support the frogs and, and the salamanders and such, leave off the fish. Other thing that they need is shelter, and I'm going to go over these in more specifics later. They need, we think of shelter, well, they need a place to sleep, but it's more than that. They have to have protection from predator, predators. They have to have a place to, to rest. They have to have a place where they can eat without worrying about a hawk coming down and grabbing them. They have to have dens where they can raise their young or places to nest. And they have to have places to rear their young. It's often at different places. Turkeys are, tend to live in the woodlands. And that's where they have their nests. But when they have the little turkeys and they need to eat, they take them out into early successional grassland type stuff so that they can run around and eat the insects. So different animals use different types of habitat at different times. But they all need shelter. There is also in your book, there's a list of websites and stuff, uh, Audubon Society uh, and Cornell University has a lot of good stuff on different kinds of shelters. Plants provide shelter. And I'm going to tell you this over and over. Think vertical layers. Even if you only have an eighth of an acre, if you think vertically, vertically, you can get lots of different kinds of plants in there. And remember, that's what we want. We want lots of different kinds of plants. The same plants that serve as food can serve as shelter. The same plants that act as food and shelter can act as a windbreak. Do not, I beg you, plant a row of Leon cypresses because you want a windbreak or, you know, privacy. That is a monoculture. How many of you lost Leyland cypresses last winter? <laughs> there was a, they took a real hit. You don't want a monoculture. You don't want a big area with just one thing. They tend to attract insects and diseases. You want you want different kinds of plants. You want a mixture of deciduous and evergreen. Okay. The evergreens do provide winter shelter. Edge habitat is very much uh, good for our things. Hedgerows, again, don't plant, don't plant a row of anything, one thing. Thickets, he talked about all of those blackberry thickets and stuff like that. They're good habitat and meadows. Different animals live in different zones. So if you have all these different layers, the trees, the canopy, and the understories, and, and then the perennials and the ground covers, different animals will live in different layers. Even if you have a big tree, some birds tend to forage on the outsides of the trees, and some birds tend to forage 
more on the inside of the trees. The more kinds of plants you have, the more kinds of insects and animals that you can support. Dead trees. I, was, I only have an acre, and I do worry about the dead trees falling on my head. Uh, obviously, you don't want a dead tree where it can fall on your house. But if you have enough space where you can live, leave dead trees, dead trees that are standing are called snags, they're wonderful for our wildlife. The woodpeckers eat the insects out of them, and then where the woodpeckers have made holes, a lot of little birds and things, they use that for nesting. So it's, it's a food source. It's sort of, I sort of compromise. I have, when I have a tree that's dead, and it's obviously going to, you know, fall over on the path where I might be walking or something, I tend to have them cut it 12 feet. <laughs> so I still have a 12-foot snag that the wildlife can use, but I don't have to worry about what it's going to fall on then. But even the dead wood on the ground supports a lot of insects, and insects provide food to all the other critters. Rock piles, I cannot stick a shovel in the ground on my property without hitting a rock. Probably a lot of you have lens. So I have lots of rock walls. Uh, you know, and the, and the chipmunks love them. But, but lots of critters like rock, rock piles. The brush piles, the pros tell you, well, you need to do, you know, they need to be six inches diameter and six inches apart. And you put them this way and then you put them that way. And then, and, you know, I just throw it in a pile. I, and, and they love it. I see when I'd been walking and I'd scare up a bird, they would fly into that brush pile for safety. So that's good habitat. And of course, nest boxes. Space. The bigger the space you have, the larger the animal you can support. Generally, the larger the animal, the more space it needs. Black bears have territories that ranges over miles. A chipmunk, maybe an acre maybe just half an acre, okay? So you individually probably don't have a large enough habitat for, for very large animals. However, if you get your neighbors to join you in providing habitat, you might be able to provide this. Some critters are territorial and they will not let another animal of that species in that area, but even animals that are not territorial, they have to live in a place where there's not so much competition that they don't have anything to eat or drink. You know, they're, they're, you don't want overt conversation. Different kinds of animals live in different habitat. Pileated woodpeckers, they need large expanse of forest. They are a forest interior species. Some types of animals will only live in forest interiors and it has to be really big, okay? The grassland critters tend to like lots of areas. Uh, so, Corridors, we mentioned this. There's a stream with a buffer alongside it, of it. This is good habitat. Little critters have to be able to get from point A to point B when they breed, when they eat, when they go for water. So migratory, one of the biggest problems with our migratory birds is that the corridors have disappeared. And there's not, there's not that protected area to support them when they're flying south. You can't manage for everything. Let's talk real quickly about these. There's four different kinds of songbirds. You know, you know this. They're the ones that, that breed here, but they, you know, they winter further south, or some of them winter here, and they breed further north, and some <laughs> stay all the time, and some, are, some just pass through. Uh, depending on habitat, you have the grassland birds, you have the forest interior birds, and you have the edge habitat. Most of the little birds you have at your, at your uh, backyard are the edge habitat. They're also divided by what they eat. Even seed eaters, even the birds that come to your bird feeder and eat those, those sunflower seeds and stuff, in the summer they will switch over to insects. And they always feed insects to their nestlings. Insects are an extremely high source of protein, twice as high in protein as beef. Uh, if you have a bird feeder, you probably have some chickadees, Carolina chickadees. One nest of Carolina chickadees requires 6,000 to 10,000 caterpillars to support in one season. It takes lots of insects. If you're going to support birds, you've got to have insects, okay? Uh, and then you have the fruit eaters. 
Diversity, I keep hitting that. You don't want those layers. You want a variety of vegetation because you have to feed them year round. Conifers are cover, leave dead trees. There's lots of bird feeders available. They are often specific to the type of bird. If you have a particular bird that you want to attract, you want to look it up on the internet. I'm not going to get that specific. Suet I have. I use mainly black sunflower seed and suet, but uh, some like our Orioles like sugar. You do not have to buy special food for hummingbirds. It's one part sugar to four parts of water that you boil and that's fine. Butterflies. We already talked about they go through this life stage. Caterpillars have to eat. If you don't have caterpillars, you're not going to have butterflies. If you don't have caterpillars, you're not going to have birds. Okay? <coughs> Most caterpillars can only eat maybe one to three families of food. If they tried to eat something else, they don't have the chemicals or the bacteria or whatever in their body to digest it. So when you plant these non-native plants, that is not host food for the larva. Okay? The pupas do not, you know, when they go into the little cocoon, they don't eat in that stage, but uh, they have to have shelter. So if you cut down all your perennials and stuff, you're getting rid of the place where they shelter because they lay their eggs on those things and they put their pupa on that stuff. So if you can stand it, it's best to leave those until spring to cut them down. Oh, and I didn't mention this pile of leaves. Leaves are wonderful. When I started gardening, it seemed like all the books I read were English books. And they all said, you have to get the leaves up off of your garden beds because it will smother your plants. Well, so I did that for a while. And then somebody said, well, you can just pull them off and chop them up and put them back. And I did it for a while. And then I figured, you know, these are woodland plants. They're used to leaf litter. So now I just leave the leaf litter there. And lo and behold, when I started studying habitat, that is wonderful. Lots of insects live in that leaf litter. It is also wonderful to control water runoff. Just leave those leaves where they lie. These are some of the kinds of trees that are good for caterpillars. Not many people think, I want a butterfly garden. I think I'll plant an oak tree. But oak trees support like 500 different kinds of caterpillars. Willows are second. Okay, so these are all good plants. And again, it's in your book. There is a colored version of, of that book that we are for sale out there, and somebody walked off with mine. I was going to show it to you. It's a big book. You have the little book in there. Yeah, this is it. I saw last year, I looked this up, I found one used copy for sale on eBay, $77. We're selling it for five. They're not in print. We have a limited quantity of them. That's why we're not just handing them out. This is free on the internet. I don't know if you'd want to print out this whole book, but this, the colored version is free on the internet if you'd rather do that. Thank you. Okay, so all these things are good for caterpillars. Nectars, these things that are good for nectar can also be plants that are good for the larva. Okay, butterfly bushes don't do it. Adult butterflies also need, you've probably seen them gather on a road. They, they need the minerals. Uh, mud puddles are good not only for the, the male butterflies, but some of the bees and pollinators use them. I have a shallow dish with wet sand and I have a liquid organic uh, fertilizer that I put in there to provide minerals for them. They need water. They need shallow water. If your water's a little deep, deeper, you can put a stone in the middle. They need shelter. They need vegetation. They shelter in wood piles. They shelter on perennials and stuff. They did one thing I have trouble with because I live in the woods. It's a basking area, but but where I have the stone walls, even the, the slanted light that hits there from time to time, they'll they'll bask on that. Pollinators. We have with us Mr. Honeybee himself, Steve McDaniel on the back, and he's selling honey out here. If you're interested in raising honeybees, he's the guy to go talk to, okay? So you might want to do that at break. You'll probably be at his booth. Pollinators are very important. 90% of all plants need some kind of animal for pollination. A third of our food supply requires pollinators. 
there are lots of different kind of pollinators. We tend to think of honeybees, and because a lot of our food crops are not native, they came from Europe or Asia. Well, the honeybees came from Europe or Asia, so they're very good at pollinating that. But a lot of our own bees are very good pollinators. Worldwide, there's like 200,000 different kinds of species that act as pollinators. In the U.S., there's over 5,000 species of bees. In Maryland alone, I think Steve was saying the other night, there's like 400 species. Uh, bumblebees tend to do colonies, but most of these are solitary. They might live, yes? I don't see the Mason bee. Is that a native bee? Yeah. I'm sorry. It, I added that, but this, this is not my latest version, apparently. Mason bees are there. Mason bees live in little sticks. I like to prune and I use, I have these elderberries and I always used to go out in the summer and prune out the deadwood. Well, lo and behold, you know what? Mason bees like to lay their eggs in dead elderberry branches, so I don't prune it out anymore. You can buy the little straws for mason bees. You can drill holes at least six inches deep and about a quarter inch around for mason bees. These are generally not aggressive. They are not out there to sting you. They're not going to sting you. They're extremely sensitive to pesticides. Please, please, please do not use those systemic pesticides on your perennials and things. All you are doing, systemic, they, it, it, it lasts, it's, it, it doesn't go away. Sometimes that systemic pesticide may stay there for two or three years and it gets in every part of the plant. It gets in the leaves that the caterpillars are trying to eat. It gets into the pollen it gets into the nectar, so all you're doing is converting them to death traps. Uh, the European Union has banned the use of imidacloprid that Steve was talking about a while ago because they think it's, you know, killing too many of their pollinators and stuff. They need, they need food spring, summer, fall. They used to be able to get lots of goldenrod and asterisk in the fall. When we started putting corn and ethanol, farmers tended, particularly out in the Midwest, where they used to have edges that were just in you know, native plants, now they plant those in corn. A lot of our, our butterflies and stuff migrate and they're in big trouble. Not only the honeybees, you may have heard of colony collapse disorder, Bumblebees, all our native birds, are also in decline. So we need to do what we can for them. This little critter up here on the left looks like a kind of bee. That's actually a fly. Mm -hmm. They mimic bees. Uh, ants are pollinators. Beetles are pollinators. Lots of different kinds of, of critters act as pollinators. And they all require food and water and shelter. Steve has already talked about the other beneficial insects. A lot of those like to live in leaf litter. If you will leave some leaf litter, you will have these beneficial insects that will eat the bad guys. You need to tolerate some holes in your leaves. You got to have the bad guys for the good guys to eat. If you kill all your bad insects, there's nothing for the good insects to eat and you're not going to have them and it's going to get out of balance. If you, just, if you leave them, I do not have a pest problem, and I do not spray stuff. Mother Nature takes care of it. If you have to get rid of something, Japanese beetles, you just tap and they will fall into a bucket of soap water. You can spray with insecticidal soap, which will only kill that particular insect. There are things you can do that's not systemic. So please, please, please do not use systemic pesticides. You're killing the insects and stuff that all of our wildlife need to survive. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Native plants with different flowering times, plants of various heights, leaf. I mean, you hear this over and over and over. Guys, this is why all of our native critters lead. It's the same thing. Herbivores, you may have heard our, our herbivores are in danger. We're losing a lot of our frogs and our amphibians. I think there's like 20, 21 kinds of salamanders maybe in Maryland and, and oh there's 21 salamanders, 20 frogs and toads that we have. Widespread decline. There's a fungus that's killing some of them. There's other things. When habitat is frag fragmented, they have trouble. You see in the spring, 
that they're trying to get to, you know, they're popping across the road trying to get to that vernal pool where they want to breed and everybody runs over them. It's a problem when it's fragmented, you know. It's, it's great if they didn't have their water and their food and everything in the same area. They need shelter, salamander particularly, needs shelter from heat. Leaf litter, think leaf litter, ground covers. We tend to think of ground cover as a plant, English ivy or, or vinca or something. Start to think of ground covers as a mixture of different plants. Again, you want a diversity. You don't want all of the same plant. Reptiles, most, most snakes are not poisonous. In, in Carroll County, there's, traditionally there are rattlesnakes. I don't think, there was a recent uh, Maryland Atlas of Reptiles and Amphibians. I don't think they found any rattlesnakes in Carroll County. They found, I think, two, cal two uh, areas that had copperheads. But most of those snakes, we seem to be afraid of snakes, but, but they are part of the ecosystem. They'll eat those voles. I want a rat snake, and because I don't have any sun, I don't seem to have one. I keep telling my neighbors, if any of you want to get rid of a snake, I'll take him. <laughs> You're more familiar with the mammals, okay? Small mammals can use small elements. Larger animals leave larger areas. Bats, we're losing all of our bats. Our bats that live in colonies, they're, they're dying from white nose syndrome. It's a fungus and spelunkers and things are spreading it from cave to cave. There's this massive die off of bats. If you want to get rid of your mosquitoes, bats are better than martins. This is the end. Your habitat plan, there, there are handouts in your folders about habitat plans. Be aware of homeowner restrictions. You may have to get your homeowners to try to, you know, you may have to try to persuade them that all that grass isn't the best thing. Educate your neighbors. Do one part of your yard at a time. Every year I dig up a little bit more grass and put in other things. You'll get overwhelmed if you try to do it all at once. So make your plan out, but then just tackle one area at a time. Mine changes every year. If you build it, they will come. When I put in a little bitty pond that I dug myself, it's only four feet around and two feet deep, a week after I had built it, I had frogs. I don't know where they came from. You know, if you build it, they will come. Remember, trees, the plants, the animals, they do stuff for us. They sequester carbon. They provide beauty. They provide shade. They're doing stuff for us. Let's do something for them. If you haven't read Doug Ptolemy's Bring in Nature Home, I would recommend it. It's excellent. These are other sites. If you want to know where to buy native plants, the Maryland Native Plant Society has a list of, of nurseries that sell native plants in Maryland. I buy things. The Audubon uh, Sanctuary in Mount Airy sells native plants on a Saturday in May. Irvine Nature Center in Baltimore County sells native plants on a Saturday in August. Uh, so these sources are in there, and I'm about out of time. What questions do you have? I hope some of you will give habitat a, a thought when you're doing your, your garden design.